Okay. No, you're not turned on. You need to reach back and turn your button on. I'm turned on. Am I on? Am I coming into the room? I think the levels okay. are off. You, you can hear me. Good. Okay, good. Thank you. I can. I can hear you much louder, though. Yeah. I don't think your mic is on, is it? Yeah. Hello, hello. You are on, okay. Yeah? yeah. Maybe, yeah. maybe you need to a little below your chin. Yeah. Out, so. A lot of stress. Every yeah. Time. Okay. Check one, two, one, two. Um, do you want to? Let's do the introduction. Let's do the introduction. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Karsten Wade. I'm a principal community architect in Red Hat in the open source program office. And my name is Marcel Hilt. I'm a senior manager in the Red Hat Emerging Technologies Group, um, and we do a lot of Bleeding edge engineering, looking forward to what's next on the horizon for two years, five years, ten years. And one of the subjects that we'll be talking about is to open up operations and right. um, other stuff. Yeah, and other stuff. And so, and, and in order to talk, to talk about opening up operations and the reasons for doing that, we're going to go in and talk about some examples that have actually been benefiting uh, from having this kind of open operations approach. And this idea of operate first is a kind of corollary to upstream first. The, of running your operations, you know, running your code and operations in a real environment before you release it as ready to go. So, um, so first, let's for, so first I want to go. We're going we're to um, take a moment to understand these, the two projects that are underneath here in the conversation. One is the OS Climate, and the other is Operate First. So OS Climate is an approach to um, dealing with. Um, um, Modeling greenhouse. Okay, so there's a really long, boring financial promise from it. What what I was thinking about was like I was taking a page from my my colleague and friend Eric, uh, who 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 got me to think and go, I went back and looked at the uh, travel app that I used to get here and found out that we it cost a, it was a 804 pounds of CO2 were dumped into the atmosphere for my flight here and then 804 will be there for me on the way back. Um, and, and so, so how, many, how many people in the audience have a, an, the availability to look at that kind of detail? Or have you ever looked at it and noticed that that's uh, available for you to look at before? Okay. So some of you. So this is a detail, and some of you, because you're using the same travel app as me, so that's part of the reason why, right? So this is not available to everybody. Um, but the idea of being able to take a piece of information about the effect on climate change and, and roll that into financial models is something that's beneficial to us as individuals. But when it comes to the um, $100 trillion dollar you know, 10-year cap markets going on where you're looking at uh, you're looking at risk profiles over a long time. Those haven't been including climate science as part of their modeling and figuring out how to get everybody together in order to do that. Um, the OS climate uh, model is basically to use the open source way of collaborating in the open and creating uh, artifacts and works and materials and code and things you can use to to uh, scale and grow from and to do which is the open source community part. And, and using that as a way to drive the innovation, and then having a data commons where you keep track of everything from the relationships between the different um, supply chains and companies so that you can track back where something came from to models and things that are helping um, be, be implemented into your financial models. Um, and all of this around being able to, to work as a community of practice about like, the predictive analysis and so forth, like things that, so that they're learning from each other as the processes are going. Um, so jumping to operate first, um, we have this goal of trying to build this, you know, we're, right now we're building this all open source community cloud because we want to prove that this model of what we're talking about works. So what is the model, right? In, in open source development, you've got an upstream project that's doing some development. Everybody, thankfully, is buying into the CI gating model. If it doesn't pass your tests, it doesn't get released. But then what happens? You send it to your users, right? It's, it's ready to go because it passed all your tests. But it hasn't done anything in the real world. All you've brought it up to is like day zero. Well, I shouldn't say zero day, but anyways, day zero. Our model starts very similar. Um, oh, and I just let me take a pause. And of course, when, you, when you've got that model, then once you've got the code in your hand, then users, either they can be looking at it in advance or in hand, then they can provide their feedback to the upstream. So it's kind of a, it's a loop that requires that release process in order for things to, to be there. So it's, it's more difficult for automation and so forth, I mean, for, for machine learning to come in and be able to, to gather more information from that experience, because there's a lot of human gating going on at the, ultimately at the end. Um, but when we come down to the bottom model, just after the CI, if we deploy into a community cloud, into an environment that's a, that is an existing production environment, but that is not the same expectation or agreement level as a full production environment for users, then they get their same return back mechanism to go back to developers, but they also have a chance to influence the testing within the cloud environment itself. 
and to test it against their own integrated environments. You've got that model you can be working back from. And then also to bring in multiple open source projects. So for example, OS Climate um, with Open Data Hub and all the dynamics there are multiple projects running as services and workloads in the Operate First Cloud, Community Cloud, and that the, uh, giving an opportunity to, to cross test and look at each other and get telemetry from each other and so forth. So let me know after this show if that makes sense to me. Any questions on that before I go on? I want to get lost. Okay, cool. So let's take a look at the OS Climate Workload uh, and what's been going on in this work community. Um, so essentially what OS Climate has been able to do is take advantage of the power of scaling that you can get by using open source innovation and open source development methodologies. Um, and, and when it comes to, and, and part of the innovation is at the end result, you want something that's a durable artifact, an actual thing that you can look at. And that in the, in mo, in the modern world is, is a pull request or an issue uh, in, a, in, a, in a code repository, in a Git repository, and the context and conversations around that, and being able to go back and look at that forever. Um, so in order to scale the community, um, having processes and tooling helps make the community self-service and self-teaching. The, uh, the document, when, when, you've learned, when you've read a document, it both teaches you how to do something, but then it often will teach you how to teach somebody else how to do it, just simply by even passing along the link. So it has a little slight um, viral nature. Um, governance is a way of reflecting essentially human systems. Who, how do I want to get a thing done? Who's in charge? How do I make it happen? What's the process? Uh, is it fair? All those things. Um, I'll go in there and, and governance gives us a chance to reflect that in and out of the technology. Um, the software is a, the, are, are the, the, this is what the open source software is the part that we've sort of proven already that we know that this model works and that being able to produce these, these findable and these durable artifacts so it could be a co piece of content or a piece of code uh, allows us to build and evolve technology more rapidly than if we're doing it in a closed environment. Just if you think of these durable artifacts as books in a library, and it's a library that we're all constantly evolving and growing into, that how valuable a resource that is, um, no matter where you are. Did I get, oh yes, and then the last one is operations. So, in the, so the, the more you make the difficult parts of things easy, you look and find the most difficult thing, and you make that easier, and you keep working down the line. And in open source development, it's always getting access to running instances of things to make stuff go. Well, our whole raison d'etre or whatever is, the, is to be that running thing, right? Both theoretically, you should have a running thing, and what the heck, let's build a running thing you can actually use. Um, so I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go through these some quick snapshots, uh, screenshots. You can look if you want to look at the pull request directly. Um, but in this, um, let's see, what have we got? So in this example, and basically the... Uh, the process was there to onboard a new service, and a community member went and used the process to start a new, to start a new service. So, so it was uh, uh, self-teaching and, and, and um, you know, self-operations or, or you know, self-service, basically. Um, in this case, the, um, the, so Trino, uh, Trino, Trino popular, you know, growing, growing in popularity is a piece of software for, uh, is, this is the database, the SQL injection stuff, right? So, um, however, not everyone knows how to use it and deploy it, so simply by putting together this pull request, it's now a reference point for other people who wanted to learn, and people have been using this, and we've got some stories about customers and partners of Red Hat, for example, benefiting from this, and, it, and you can imagine that if, um, uh, a Trino package so, uh, software, something being packaged as part of a, a Red Hat release would then have this, this piece of content or this piece of, um, um, this piece of configuration as an example into the documentation. I mean, it, it definitely has a feed in that goes in, uh, down in benefit. Um, so this, uh, the, the next one here, this is, um, this is an example of governance in effect, and this was where like, in a conversation with, with Kara, we were, we were making some decisions and started to pull together the, the pull request, and so this pull request was written Why were we in the meeting, and at the end of the meeting, she finished it up and, and submitted it. And so then we, had, we not just had a record of the conversation that she and I had, which was something that couldn't scale, that conversation couldn't scale, but our record could scale, and it could produce something that caused further conversations that pulled everybody else into it. Um, and then being able to, to, to have that be that durable artifact in time. Um, and then this is another example. This is an example of, uh, of operations benefiting by having, um, uh, by having access to, what was this one? This is the, um, I guess we did the sandbox filter. Yeah, that one. So these are both examples of ones where, where a, developer needed, a developer wanted to make something happen operationally and did a pull request, and for the most part, it was all automated to have it happen. There are, and, and it automatically grabs something and says, hey, take a look, and I take a look and say, yeah, it looks good to me, and boom, it happens. So much simpler, lower process to be able to get things done. Um, yeah, so those are what those two examples were. 
Um, oh, I was going backwards, pardon me. I know my buttons. So, so let me jump over to another half of this, which is um, uh, the, the SIG SRE, the, which is a community of practice that we're just beginning uh, to work with. And the idea is that if we're gonna be creating this open environment, we need to, part of it is the policies, the processes, the, the and, and these days, when you do a cloud environment, it's, a, it's site reliability engineering. Because being reliable for your users, matching that service level is the goal of what we're here for, right? So, so in order to do that, we know, since it doesn't exist beyond the great book from the, from, and blog art posts from Google engineers and so forth, um, we've decided that what, at the very least what we could do is start to gather things together by thinking about it as a community of practice and inviting that participation. And so, so, one, so we have some participation from a couple of different um, groups so far, and one of them is a, is a group of SREs um, inside of Red Hat who are beginning to, out, to put out some of their materials, um, including architectural decision records, which is a single record that explains a technical decision. So it's, an even, it's taken that durable artifact concept to another level where you're, you're, you're thinking about, you're creating an, uh, um, a record for the artifact that the record is standardized and that the end result is, in, is, a, uh, is the durable artifact, right? Um, another example is that we've started creating SRE training materials, and because, again, all this stuff doesn't uh, exist, we started it from the, from the beginning level. So the two courses up right now are around open source basics and, and a general introduction to the project as a first piece. And that's part of and we'll be producing our own um, uh, a pathway for how to be successful in GitHub, for example, because that's a barrier to a lot of people. And when you say, oh, just make a pull request, that you know, half the audience just said, oh, oh, that's not me, I've never done that before. And so being able to help make that accessible to everybody, picking the hardest thing to do and making it easy is, is part of the plan. Um, and then we've also been working on long form content, uh, things that are being put out in, in, as blog posts, but ultimately they have a, they have a, a green, they have a, just a general, you'll see in a moment what a general URL is like. So just again, a couple screenshots and you can pull them up if you're interested in seeing more detail. Um, so this is an example of an architectural decision record. All the conversation about it can happen in the pull request. The end result is a record that actually both captures the meaning of the conversation and the conversations findable by it. Um, and so, the, and then, and, and which then are then repeatable. I, I, the, I mean, obviously, you can, you you take this concept and you apply it to a real environment. And these are concepts that have been that we apply to our real environment, the Opera First Community Cloud, and have been applied to other real environments are, are ready to go. Um, the um, so this is the the training materials, and so this is an example of an o, uh, open source software basics, and the and and when the OS climate community was coming together, not everyone who came into the room had the same understanding of open source. And so rather than just figuring, they'd figure it out amongst themselves later, the community architect, very wisely in my opinion, got, got together and pulled materials and did some training and it was really beneficial. People learned a lot, it built the relationships in the community, it built trust, common understanding across the training. And. Um, this is another example. We, one of the first um, new long pieces is up. The URL, as you can see, is designed to be permanent. It's not dated. You know, it's just right there. Boom. Here's the chaos testing guide. It goes with um, uh, ADR number 13, I think. So it was in there somewhere. Number 12. And that is, um, and so this is a chaos testing guide that goes with the architectural decision record and so forth. So creating that whole entire body of pieces is, is there. And so these are just, um, these are kind of just at the beginning, we're looking to connect up with, uh, with SREs and other people who are interested in learning about these practices and creating them from the beginning. So now let's get SREL. Yep. Okay, so um, what made open source software great was like you could stick into everything, like from the premise where the project started right down into the code, into every single detail of the code. And the same thing we want to make happen for operations, for anything in the SRE world. So what I want you to get from this part of the um, talk is something really actionable, where you can use your hands and put them on a keyboard and do something. Right? So what Carsten just showed you where some larger communities actually already practicing this model, like the OS Climate community, which is a set of um, yeah, seasoned engineers doing, doing really, really good stuff and um, benefiting from the Operate First community. But how do I approach this if I'm 
new to SRE practices? How do I approach this if, I've, if I want to just learn how GitOps <laughs> works and such? With software, it's easy. I go to Stack Overflow, or I do some tutorials, and I start doing stuff on my laptop. Is that so easy with SRE? Obviously not, because you need a cloud environment to do so. So in order to participate here, you need to have just a GitHub handle. So I remove the word just because it's obviously you don't also need to sign up for GitHub. You need to have some interest of participating, etc. But what you see now is all accessible to you with a GitHub handle. So you can go to your laptop after this talk, go to all the URLs and see what's happening here on the screen by yourself in a read-only fashion, obviously. So you, we don't give you access to actually break the environment, but you can follow along. So you can see real GitOps practices in your browser and start really from the, from the beginning of observing, looking, playing with it, doing some tweaks, and then eventually also do your own stuff. And the community shouldn't be also, uh, should also be inclusive to all personas, not only on this scale of proficiency, so from beginners to real experts, but also really inclusive to every person that is involved in setting up in such an environment. And it's not just developers, it's um, the people that operate the boxes. It's the people that develop workloads. It's people that develop the, the components of the platform. It's obviously users. So without users, you have a really sad deployment because then it's just your CI CD test, but you want to have actual end users using your workloads, using your environment so that you get that immediate feedback loop. You want to have people that support people because a question asked is not a dumb question. It's just something that's maybe not explained well enough, or maybe it's a, it's a deficiency in your product because it's not so easy to discover. So I also want people that help people in that community to see all those questions raised. And I want to have architects building out demo environments, building out um, like use cases in, in, in a cloud environment where you use these Lego building blocks to s stick something new together instead of writing it from scratch. So you can build upon the Lego blocks that others bring to that environment without setting it up yourself. And eventually, so my background was also in AI ops, hopefully at some point we also get all the machines there, feed on that data and automate all the stuff so that we can do more, more stuff. <laughs> so in one sentence, we want to build a hybrid cloud with a full visibility into the operations center. So make it really open from the API endpoints, from the user interface, but also back into the ops center. And by, by definition, every deployment is somewhat proprietary because you don't want to open it up to, um, you don't want to open up your logs because you have PII information there. You have customer success in it. So usually a cloud deployment stops at the user level or at the documentation level. And this is what made software great by opening it up, and now we want to do that same for operations and for services. So a quick rundown through the actual environment that we have. We started out with a larger deployment at the Mass Open Cloud. It's a, hosted at, a, at, the Boston, at the data center at the Boston University. Then we have another deployment at Hetzner, which is a German rec space kind of provider. So there's also a deployment. So boom, now we're multi-geo. We're in two geos having deployments there. We have clusters running in AWS. So we're really hybrid. We have something on-premise running in two data centers, and we have something in the cloud environment. So that's pretty much a multi-geo hybrid cloud environment that we have here, which you can inspect on your, in your browser and see how it's being set up with all the good GitOps um, principles. And looking into the future, we try to expand that into maybe IBM Cloud, Google Cloud, or other educational data center providers. So going 
A little bit up the stacks, obviously we have workloads running there, most prominent, prominently the Open Data Hub, we just saw pre uh, previously, we have Project Thoth running there, another project out of the emerging tech group, so we really use that environment to also do our own prototyping there. We have um, communities out of, um, out of the Java world, out of the Python world, Epicurio, Quarkus, Java, and Pulp is a um, Python index. Then you also want to do some management and automation. ACM is uh, Advanced Cluster Manager, which we use to set up the Kubernetes and OpenShift clusters. We have Argo CD for um, continuous integration and continuous deployment. There's Prow from the Kubernetes uh, community installed there being used. We have Tekton pipelines for um, all the pipeline goodness. And we try to treat everything as a service. So we're open to installing alpha versions, beta version of operators, as long as they are installed in a GitOps fashion. So if we break the cloud, we can roll it back and um, expose some early bugs. But we also want other members of the environment to use these components as a service so that we can get this integration benefits from testing several components of the cloud. How do they work? Not in isolation, but in a real setup where they integrate with other services. And last but not least, all the operational data that we are creating so that we can have traces, logs, metrics from real production environments that are licensed under a, an open source, open data license, so that machine learning people and um, other ops folks can dig into them and inspect them and maybe take some information out of these um, for their own problems. So in the future, I imagine a, a Google search for a stack trace or something, and I'm not just in a stack overflow issue, but I'm actually ending up in the Operate First Community Cloud, and I see how a problem appeared and how it's being solved because of the locks, all the, all the data that led to that problem is still available for inspection. So I will try to take you to a um, less complicated example, um, how we deployed a service on the Operate First Community Cloud, and then how you can replicate that yourself or how you can contribute to this. So, Peribolos um, is an application which does declarative GitHub org management. We all love Kubernetes because it's um, declarative. You just put out your configuration and eventually it will end up in your, uh, the, 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 the cluster will end up in the state that you declared. A lot of people are also using GitHub for their development. Um, for the development environment. So how about also declaring the state of your GitHub organization in a declarative way? This is what Peribolos did, and that um, has been released to the Kubernetes community at um, KubeCon in 2019. But it's, it's, an, it's an a, a binary that you run on your computer. So instead of Instead of running it yourself, how about running it as a service? So we created a GitHub app to run your, uh, to run the Peribolos executable and provide it to the, to the community, provide it to everybody for use. And you could stop there and just use it, install it into your repository, but maybe you don't want to do this because you don't trust the people that are running this service. Maybe you want to improve how it's being run. Maybe you want to contribute to it. So this is how you would go about installing such an application on the Operate First Community Cloud. How are we doing on time? Good. 
Good, good, good. So I, I laid out my, my architecture. I laid, uh, created my, my, my code, what, what not now. Now, what's next? How do I get access to it? And you go to the Operate First um, website, go to Community Cloud, and you have links to the clusters, to the um, environments that we provide, that are provided. You can either go to this Get Support link, which leads to a support repository, and you could file an issue here to get onboarded to one of the, to one of the clusters. Or you could do it yourself because um, all the runbooks and the documentation on how to do that is pretty much documented in these, in these runbooks. So that's, that's the material that usually your back-end folks get, your operational folks get, your SREs. They have documented how to operate your environment. And this is what we're doing in, completely in the open so you could either request somebody else from the community to help you guide through it, or you run through the runbook yourself. So you go to cluster management and look at onboarding a project, and then it's all written down here how you would do that yourself. So here are the pull requests created to onboard um, this project. You start with creating a namespace, then you would want to also deploy your application. Um, and as you see, these pull requests were created by multiple people from our team. So we really spread this, these tasks to people that were not so proficient in doing these things. Because we thought if we let it be done by somebody who's already proficient and uh, experienced with it, doing it, um, nothing gained, but let somebody else do it and let him learn it and then create this pull request by, um, by himself or by herself. We get a validation of the run books and the documentation and improve that um, in, in this regard. So now that we created the pull requests, how do we get that deployed to the clusters? And this is where we are following a GitOps procedure. So in GitOps, you want to have everything defined as, as code. Like Kubernetes, everything is uh, declared, how your cluster would look like. But you also want to declare in a Git repository how your application is being deployed. The good thing about it being tracked in version control is that you could roll back every change, but you also have a history how it's being deployed for later inspection. So people can look at it um, and really track and follow along how this application, how this thing was being created and anticipated. So you write down in a YAML file and then you get it actually deployed on your cluster. And we've cho chosen Argo CD as our continuous deployment tool because it's a cloud native um, tool. It really fits our infrastructure. That doesn't mean that we will always stick to Argo CD. So if somebody has different needs for deploying something or wants to try out another continuous deployment tool, you can bring that to the community and deploy that tool there. It's, but in the end, Argo CD is available for the community to use, and you can use it without setting up your own Argo CD environment. And you can inspect it and, and see how it's being used without setting something up yourself. So Argo would monitor the cluster state, and um, if a change happens, it takes action, and then um, it will apply the, 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 the change to the cluster so that um, finally 
results in the desired state and then continues this, this loop on and off. So going back to our browser, this is, would be our Peribolos application running here. And you see it's, it's synced. And here are all the resources that are being deployed, like um, a service monitor, um, custom role bindings, etc. So you can log in with the uh, GitHub account here and see how this application is being deployed. You can even go one step further and log into the back end of the OpenShift cluster and see all the tasks being executed to actually execute these uh, Peribolos actions that you have been using as a service previously. So if I'm uh, installing my app in my, GitHub report, in my GitHub org, it will trigger some task runs and instead of just relying the service doing its thing and then performing the required actions, I can go back to the back end and see how it's doing these actions. And if they are failing, I can inspect why they failed and maybe open up a, a change or um, help fixing this. So if I'm still logged in, I can go in here and click on the logs and boom, I see what what this thing did. I can also go to a public Grafana dashboard and see, see about the state of, of, of the clusters and um, work on the metrics that the Peribolos application exposes. And actually, that's, that's something that you could contribute to um, in, in, this, in this project. Here are some, some issues that are open up for community contribution, where we will help you and guide you through the process of actually doing this, this um, kind of backend work. Good. And that's, that's it. This is how you can either follow along how a service is being deployed or make changes to this service that's deployed, or you can fork the service and instantiate a, your own version of that service and try out things, try out um, modulations to that service or learn from that service and, um, and um, apply it to some other Bot. So you don't really have to start from scratch, and you don't have to, um, I mean, you still have to read the documentation, but you can actually inspect a running environment, a running instance of um, such, an, such a service, and um, yeah, learn from that instead of just doing it and inventing it all from on your own. So here are the links um, to, to our website, the GitHub uh, repository and most of the applications that we have running here. And that's it. And if you have, do you have some questions? Yes, we have any questions. Now we're fighting for questions. And we have stickers. So if you have good questions or if you have bad questions, there are no bad questions. Good question. So the question was if we, um, um, how, if, if we're using uh, pull requests and issues in GitHub as essentially a way to track issues, is there a way to track to connect those across the Jira tickets or another ticketing system that does that? Yeah. Right? yeah. Um, so the, the answer is that we have no prohibition against doing that. We have not built anything as far as I know to do so. So it's to ask of the if that's a need that someone has, if that's a need that you have, and it's, and it's a barrier, come work with us and we'll figure out how to make that part work. Because I know that there's a uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of that stuff out there. In terms of would, is that answer the question that you were? 
Yeah, asking yeah, or? I think, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, I was I'm sure I wasn't sure if you were, for a moment I thought you were going to be asking if we why we didn't use Jira instead or something, which is a whole other topic that I'm not going to answer. Good, good, didn't for sure. Thanks. Yeah, and to to add to that, um, we have projects that are tracking their issues and changes in Jira. So, mm -hmm. um, issues.redhat.com is based on Jira, and some of the Open Data Hub folks are using Jira to track issues, and this is where you essentially link back to any other issues to any other community and that's super essential to have that to either for one have community metrics on how are we impacting other communities so that we can count we have these issues um, generated in the operate first community which link back to another community and then it's just a matter of linking back and forth but but ultimately i think you've you've, you've connected in with one of the most important aspects of what we're doing because in a an open source projects like communication and life cycle thing, you've got these like synchronous things like we're doing here, which it doesn't really scale very well. The async, which has to be a form or a mailing list for like that low barrier to entry. And then you've got your library, right? That the, the durable artifacts. And everybody's got our own and that, but that's where we have to put our energy to, to, to solve and automating and cross connecting things because then it just makes everybody's life easier. I mean, the other ones put energy into as well, but you know, <laughs> these are the ones we can fix with software best, so. Any other uh, questions here online? Who make up so? Was the, um, so the, the, my operate first slide with the animation, that was the first time that I've uh, presented that one today. It's a fresh one. Did, uh, was, how did that go for anybody? Did that work okay? Any question? Got a plus one over here. It was good, okay. All right, thank you. All right. Um, that was my question for the audience. Do you have any questions <laughs> for the audience? No. Okay, well, no. You, we took your questions, you took our questions. I think that means we must be done then. Thank you yeah. very much, everybody. So we have some stickers up here. Come, come forward and grab some stickers and uh, call to action, go to Operate First and it, yeah. click all the links. Check out the new website, tells you what to do. Thank you.